Good to see you here tonight. I invite you to take God's Word, please, and open to uh, the Old Testament book of 2 Kings as we continue in our journey through this book. 2 Kings, we're going to look t- tonight at 2 Kings chapter 12. So find 2 Kings chapter 12, and uh, we're going to look at this whole chapter tonight. And uh, while you're finding that, I read about a man by the name of Zane Robertson. He was a world-class marathon runner. And uh, he reports that uh, he, he doesn't remember the, the final uh, 10 kilometers of a race that he ran after he stumbled right at the finish line. He was a world-class runner. He was expected to win the race. But uh, he later wrote, as he recalled the, the race, he said his last memory was passing another runner before he said the lights went out at around 32 kilometers. And... Uh, He went on to say, somehow I got to the finish line running on fumes, even though I don't remember anything or finishing. And he said, after finishing, I woke up in the medical tent in an ice bath with a thermometer given to me. Well, he was was okay later, but here's his world-class runner who was expected to uh, win the race. In fact, he started off very strong, but he stumbled at the finish line. You know, one of the metaphors the Bible uses in the Christian life is that of a runner in a race. And the race that we run is not a 100-yard dash, it's a marathon. God's desire for all of us is that we not only finish the race that he puts before us, but that we finish strong. Uh, The writer of Hebrews had this in mind when he said, let us run with patience the race that is what? Set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And then later on in Hebrews 12, he said this, wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight has for your feet. What was he talking about there? He was actually going back to that original metaphor of a runner in a race, and he's basically saying, look, uh, God disciplines you so that you can finish the race strong. He doesn't want you at the end of the race um, with feeble knees running out of the pathway. He wants you running straight. He wants you running strong. And so that's why God will uh, test us. That's why God will discipline us Paul said this, he said, Know ye not that they which run all in a race, uh, they all but one receives the prize. And he goes, therefore, he says, I I run, he says, uh, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. He said, I keep my body, I bring it into subjection, lest by any means that when I preach to others, I should be a castaway. Again, Paul's really just using athletic terms there, saying that in this Christian race, he wants to finish strong. And indeed, later on in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, he said, I fought a good fight. I have finished my what? Finished my course. He ran the race very well. And so he said, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Now, just because you start the race strong doesn't mean you're going to finish strong. Now, I say all that because we see this in the life of Joash, the king of Judah. This is the one we're going to look at here in chapter 12. Um, He started the race strong. Um, He was the only son of David alive to continue the Davidic line. You might remember that the wicked queen Athaliah had killed all of the uh, the descendants of David and and usurped the throne and took it for herself. At least she thought she killed all of them. One was protected by um, Jehoiada, a godly priest, and his wife. And he was hidden and he was protected and later he was put on the throne. He was the hope of Israel. And when he took the throne at a very young age, all the hope of Israel was in this this king, this son of David. And what we're going to see is he does many commendable things. He starts out very strong. He starts out doing really well, but he stumbles at the finish line, and he has a bad ending to the race. Now, so I want us to look at the life of Joash here, and I want it to be an example to us because um, I don't know about you, but I want to finish this race strong, don't you? I want to finish strong for God. I don't want to stumble at the finish line. So I want us to look at four important principles that we can learn from the life of Joash here in this story that will help us uh, finish the race of life strong. Number one, here's the first one. Don't stop doing what is right in the sight of God. Don't stop doing that. Look in verse number one. And in the, reign, in the seventh year of jo, uh, Jehu, Joash began to reign, and 40 years reigned he in Jerusalem. And look at verse number 2, and and Joash did that which was right in the sight of the the Lord all his days, um, and 
it says, all his days were in Jehoiada, the priest instructed him. So I, I know it's uh, Jehoash. Sometimes in the Bible it's Jehoash or Joash. It's easier to say Joash, so I'm going to say that, all right, <laughs> here. Um, and so what we see here, the very first thing is what I call the measure. He gets a, you know, the writer of Kings would always give an evaluation or a report card of every king um, right at the very beginning. And, and notice the report card for him or the evaluation he did in verse number two. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days. Now, remember I told you that every king in Israel or Judah was measured according to David. Remember I said David was a measuring rod? And so the writer of Kings would always use David and measure them against him and say, you know, he either did what was right like his father David or he didn't do right like David. And here he is commended. In fact, the expression that the writer uses here for Joash is the identical expression that he uses to describe the behavior of David in 1 Kings 15, 5. It said, David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. And so does Joash. So now the writer says he's a true son of David. And the way he starts, he behaves like David, his great-great-grandfather. So he starts off this race in the strongest possible terms. And, and, all, and just as I would say this as an application, just as in the Old Testament, David was kind of measure, a measuring rod for all the kings, you know who we measure ourselves again here in this age? It's Jesus, our king. He's the one we measure ourselves again against. If you want to please God, if you want to do right, just be like Jesus. Remember what John said, 1 John 2, 6, He that saith he abideth in him, you say that you're a Christian, you say you know Jesus, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Here's the measure of your uh, true salvation. Are you walking like Jesus? So you might say, well, how can I know how, how Jesus would walk and what he would do? That's why you have to know the Bible. That's why you have to study the life of Christ, because we learn more about Jesus. And we know that when we do things like Jesus, it's pleasing to God. But I want you to notice another thing about Joash. I call this the mentor. We saw the measure, but the mentor. The reason he was able to do what was right is because he had someone to follow. Look again in verse number 2 where it says, He did right in the sight of the Lord all his days, wherein Jehoiada the priest, what? Instructed him. Part of the reason he was able to walk like he, supposed, he was supposed to walk was because he followed the example of a godly man, Jehoiada, this high priest. Notice it says he instructed him, or the word is teach. He was his teacher. He was his mentor. He was a godly role model for his life. And beloved, this is God's way. God's plan is that older believers, older godly believers, be an example and a mentor to younger believers. Um, that you disciple a younger believer. I just would encourage, if you're an older believer in the Lord, you've been saved many years, you see a new believer, someone young, go over and Try to be an encouragement to them. Try to develop a relationship where you can encourage them and teach them in the way of God. That's always God's way in Scripture. Joshua learned under Moses. Samuel learned under Eli. Eli. Elisha learned under Elijah. Timothy learned under Paul. All the apostles learned under Jesus. In fact, in Titus 2, 3, and 4, it says that godly women are to teach younger women. Older godly women are to teach younger women. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. He wasn't on an ego trip there. He was just trying to follow Jesus. And he said, look, just, just follow my example. And that's been God's way. And so, and, and I would say if you're a newer, younger believer, try to find an older believer that is walking a godly life and, and learn from them and submit to them and ask their counsel and Ask God to bring godly mentors into your life. That's what Jehoiada was for Joash. And the Bible says, you know, you know how long Jehoiada lived? He lived 130 years. That's a good long life. And when he finally dies, this is what the Bible says. It's in, the, in the account in 2 Chronicles 24, it says, But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died. 130 years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and towards his house. He was such a godly influence on the nation that he was given an honorable burial, the burial of a king, because he did well. He finished the race strong. 
So here's the second principle. Number one, don't stop doing what is right in the eyes of God. But here's number two, don't make any compromises with sin or idolatry. Look at verse three. Here's the one thing where Joash went wrong, but, in the, but the, in the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. Now, I want to remind you of this. I've told you this before, but the writer of Kings judges every king by another standard. Remember what I told you it was? By what they do with the high places. Now, what were the high places, if you remember? These were hills. If you go to Israel, there's, it's a land of hills. All around Jerusalem, there are hills and, and mounts. And what they would do is they would take a hill and they would build an altar there, and that's where they would go and do false worship. They wouldn't go to the temple in Jerusalem. They would go to one of these hills. And, and normally at these hills, they had a carved wooden pole. Um, they had an, an altar. Um, they had some kind of idol of a male deity or even a female de- deity there. That was a place where they, they sacrificed animals and um, they even would um, just do some horrendous things there that I don't want to get into. The Bible says that uh, in 2 Kings 17, 10, and they set them up images and groves upon every high hill and under every green tree. And so you know, I, I, when I went to Israel once, I visited one of these high places right there at a place called Dan. That's right where King Jeroboam built um, a high place to, uh, with one of his golden casts and set up false worship. Now, God hated these high places. It's obvious why, because it lured his people away from him to worship false gods. It also lured people away from the temple, which was in Jerusalem. That's where God set up to be the place to worship him, the central location. And God made it very clear that he wanted those high places out of the land. And so the writer of Kings, every time he would give an evaluation of a king, he would always let us know, what did he do about the high places? And we read in the books of First and Second Kings that a lot of these kings didn't do anything about them. Good kings would abolish them. Mediocre kings would kind of tolerate them. Evil kings would patronize them and build even more. By the way, do you know how many of all the kings of Israel, do you know how many actually removed the high places and crushed them and got rid of them? There was only two. One was Hezekiah and the other one was Josiah. That's it. Every other king left them there. Now, here what we read about Joash was in verse number three, that he did not take away those high places. This might seem like a small thing, um, but actually this small compromise in the beginning of his life will lead him to great spiritual disaster because the writer of 2 Chronicles will give us a parallel account, and what he'll tell us is that Uh, Joash ultimately abandoned the worship of God completely by the end. And he ended up worshiping idols and false gods. And God would send prophets to him about it, but he ignored them. In fact, let me read to you. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 17. Now, after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah, and they made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened to them, and they left the house of the Lord, God of their fathers, and served groves and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this trespass. You hear what happens here? Jehoiada, the godly high priest, dies. Uh, He's no longer a godly mentor for Joash. And now you have these other guys coming in, speaking into the life of the king. And they pull him out of the house of God, and they lead him up to these high places. And he begins to sin there. And the Bible says in verse 19, And yet uh, he sent prophets to them to bring them again into the Lord and to testify against them, but he would not give ear. That is, Joash wouldn't listen to the prophets. God kept sending prophets, and Joash wouldn't listen. Eventually, he he sent a prophet by the name of Zechariah. You know who Zechariah was? He was the son of Jehoiada, the godly priest. And And Zechariah preached against this idolatry, and Joash didn't appreciate it. So you know what Joash did? Joash had... Zechariah stoned in the temple court, killed. How is that for gratitude? Jehoiada basically saved Joash's life. Jehoiada led Joash all his life, um, was kind of like a, a father to him. And in return, what does he do? He, 
he, he turns away from the Lord, and he murders the son of the man who had sp- spoken truth into his life all those days. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus refers to this murder in Matthew 23. Joash was such an ingrate, uh, and these little compromises led him to just wholesale murder and apostasy towards the end of his life. But, beloved, that's the way sin is. When you make compromises with sin in your life, it might be little compromises to you at the beginning, but sin uh, grows, doesn't remain dormant. It gets bigger. And the little sin that we tolerate will eventually overtake us in our life if we don't deal thoroughly with it. The great preacher Spurgeon said, Christian, beware lest thou take sin lightly. Take heed lest thou fall little by little. Sin a little thing? Is it not poison? Who knows its deadliness? Sin a little thing? Do not the little foxes spoil the grapes? Doth not the tiny coral itself build a rock which wrecks a navy? Sin a little thing? It girded the Redeemer's head with thorns and pierced his heart. Could you weigh the least sin in the scales of eternity, you would fly from it as from a serpent. Look upon sin as that which crucified the Savior, and you will see it as exceedingly sinful. So make no compromise with sin. Declare war on all sin in your life. Get rid of any idols. Make no peace with it. Those little compromises that we make right now, well, unlikely, uh, well, likely, I should say, bring great damage, and we will not finish the race strong. Here's number three. Number one, don't stop doing what is right in the sight of God. Number two, don't make any compromises with sin or idolatry. But here's number three, don't stop making the house of God a priority in your life. Now, again, we go back to some good things that Joash did. Look at verse four. And Joash said to the priests, all the money of the dedicated things that is brought into the house of the Lord, even the money of everyone that passes the account, the money that everyone that is set at, and all the money that cometh into the Uh, any man's heart to bring it into the house of the Lord. Let the priest take it, and to them, every man of his acquaintance, and let them repair the breaches of the house, wheresoever any breach shall be found. So now Joash, here again at the beginning, he does some commendable things. And one of the things that he does that is really good is he was determined to repair the house of God and restore proper worship. It had been 150 years since this thing had been built. It was certainly time for that. And so he determines to set out to renovate and renew worship in the house of the Lord. Part of the reason it was in disrepair was because, you remember, Queen Athaliah was on the throne for seven years, and she began to try to reestablish the worship of Baal. You remember, Jehu came along. He stamped out Baal worship in Judah. But when Athaliah took the throne, she went about to reestablish it. And she was using things in the temple for Baal worship. In fact, write down 2 Chronicles 24, 7. says this, For the sons of Athaliah, that wicked woman, had broken up the house of God, and also all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord did they bestow upon Balaam. She broke into the house of the Lord. She began to use it for the worship of Baal. She took some of the dedicated holy things and began to use them uh, for their idolatry. And Joash, now, he's purging the temple. He's get, getting rid of all of that. He wants to totally renovate the temple. And so the first thing he does is he goes to find out how much money that they have had collected so that he can do all of these repairs. Now, what we see in verse number four is pretty interesting. It's three types of collections or offerings that he mentions in verse number four. Um, first, there's tithes. This is money collected in the census, half shekel per head due to the uh, every adult of military age. This is found in Exodus 30, 11 to 16. This collection went all the way back to the time of Moses. Every Israelite, whether you were rich or poor, had to offer this to the Lord. This was sometimes called atonement money because it was given in gratitude to God for salvation. And this was money that was normally used to help in the setting up of the tabernacle and the care of the tabernacle. Today, we would just call this a tithe. This is just a tithe of the Old Testament. And this is what Christians should do. Um, Now, sometimes Christians will ask whether tithing is still mandatory. You know, after all, that was the Old Testament. That was law. Now we live under grace. You know, most surveys show that American Christians give less than 4% of their gross income to God. That's embarrassingly low, I got to tell you. 
But if people in the Old Testament had a good reason to tithe, don't you think people in this age have a good reason to tithe? If a Jew under law gave 10%, what should we as Christians under grace give? I think 10% is, is a good starting point for us. Um, I don't see anything in Scripture that would cancel out in the, in the New Testament the principle of tithing that was established in the Old Testament. Abraham commenced it. He gave tithes to, to the king of uh, uh, Salem. Moses commanded it in Exodus. Jacob continued doing it. Jesus com- commended it. He said to the Pharisees, you know, you tithe mint and cumin. They even were so fastidious, they tithed their spices. I don't think God expects you to do that. But Jesus was saying, you know, you guys are kind of overly righteous, and, you know, you're tithing that, and that's good. The only problem is your righteousness is outward. It's not inward. Who are we to cancel this? So this is a principle that is taught in Scripture. But then there's pledges. The other part in verse number four is money received from personal vows. And this is recorded in Leviticus 27. These are people, this would kind of be like faith promise pledges today, where a person would just offer a pledge and then they would just follow through. This was a regular part of Old Testament worship. And when it comes from a person's heart, it's beautiful in the sight of God. Psalm 116, verse 17 through 19 says this, I will offer thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord. This is a worshiper that was so grateful to God that he made a pledge. And I I just want to do something I want to give. And he did. And it was just a beautiful expression of worship. But then also free will offerings. This was just money brought on a voluntary basis just because there was a need. A person might see a need or Um, again, they might be thankful for some precious thing that God did in their life. And this was established in Exodus 35, 21, where it says, and then came everyone whose heart stirred him up and everyone whom his spirit made willing. Their heart was stirred um, to do something. You know, we hear people sometimes say, you know, God laid this on my heart to do this. That's good theology because that's exactly how the Bible talks about it in the Old Testament. And this is a beautiful, again, a beautiful expression of worship. So we have three kinds of offerings here that he's talking about in verse 4. A tithe is what a person should give. A pledge is what a person would give. A free will offering is what a person could give. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. And so this is, a, this, is a, this is what Joash does. He goes, he checks. But what he finds out, after he, he sees the money, he says, okay, let's use this money now, and let's build, let's renovate the house of the Lord. So um, I want you to see the next point here, what I call the oversight. So he tells them to collect the money, be accountable, and then he tells them in verse 5, let the priest take it to them, every man of his acquaintance, and let them repair the breaches of the house, whithersoever any breach shall be found. And so... Um, he tells the priest, you take care of this, you oversee this, you do this. He kind of delegates it out. But the priests were lax in their duties. And years go by and nothing was done. Look at verse 6. But it was so that, when the three, that in the three and twentieth year of King Joash, the priests had not repaired the breaches of the house. Yeah, years went by. And these guys still haven't done anything. Sound like Baptist to me. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, I'm just kidding. I don't really mean that. Um, Perhaps they were selfish. Um, Instead of giving the money over, they were kind of pocketing it for themselves. Uh, And and that's not really a a dishonest thing because these monies were brought in for the priests. Um, Maybe they were just not good administrators with the money, or maybe um, they didn't think it was very important to care for the temple as much as to care for people. But one commentator says that they were not anxious to spend good money on mere buildings. And another, another commentator was more critical and accused them of doing something sacrilegious, of mismanagement or incompetence. I think part of the problem was they were just unorganized, and, and they were using the money for needs, and then that money would go away, and they didn't have the money. It never really accumulated the way they were thinking. So I want you to see the organization so Joash steps in, look at verse 7. Then King Joash called for Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said unto them, Why repair ye not the breaches of the house? Now therefore receive no more money of your acquaintance, but deliver it for the breaches of the house. 
And the priest consented to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. What he, do, what he does, he takes matter into, matters into his own hands. He sets up a safe place to collect tithes and pledges and free will offerings. What he does is he gets this box, and he puts it at a certain place in the temple, and he puts a hole in the box, and it was locked, of course, and people could come by, and they could put money in that box, and marked on the box was building or temple repair. So any money that you put in this box is going to be completely for the re-renovation of the temple. And when the box was filled, they would take that money and then they would give it into the hands of the builders. Look at verse 10. And it was so that when they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and they put up in bags and told the money that was found in the house of the Lord. And so when the box was full, they would count it, they would weigh it. Notice it was two people there, not just one accountability, even though one was the high priest, you still had someone else there. And according, according to verse 11, they would give the money directly to the builders in verse 11, who had oversight of the house of the Lord, and none of the funds was used for utensils in the temple, but all for the building. And the Bible says they did that, and they began to work, and it was honest. In verse 15, moreover, they reckoned not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be bestowed on workmen, for they dealt faithfully. That is, these people were honest. They gave the money to them. They were good and faithful stewards of it, and they used the money to do all the refurbishing and the remodeling in the house of the Lord. But now, don't think that the, the priest suffered, because look in verse 16. The trespass money and sin money was not brought into the house of the Lord. It was the priest. In other words, they kept a separate account. They kept just from the box money for the temple repair, and all the other monies was still used for the normal ministrations, ministry of the temple. Part of that was um, for the priests who needed that for support. So what they did was they got together and got a budget, basically. And they started operating, and they were more organized. And Joash led all of that. And so King Joash did a really good thing here. This is commendable. He spent the Lord's money on two things. One was on the proclamation of God's word. Part of the ministry of the priest was to proclaim the, the word. And the other part was used on the preservation of God's house. Those two things go hand in hand. The house of the Lord and the servants of the Lord who proclaim the word of God. And so the king well understood that if there was any hope of ever really seeing the worship of God return, these things had to be done. Now, the same principle applies to us today here in the church. And I thank God for, for people who, who do a good job taking care of all these things. And by the way, let me just stop here and say, you know, we are blessed here at Grace to have men who do, do a tremendous job you know, counting our money and taking care of it, and we just have just the best and um, being, you know, responsible uh, with it. And um, all of this is, a, is, is where we learn from here in this scripture that's really these principles here. It's good to see and um, all these things that are taking place, and certainly we're to do this here in this age, and uh, the, the Bible tells us that, to use God's resources to see the work of God go forward. But here's the principle I learned from this here, from Joash, that he focused on the house of the Lord. God and the worship of God and the house of God for a time in his life, it was a priority. And he was determined to do it. And as long as he did that, he was doing well. And he dedicated himself to that. He made sure it was done. He didn't just um, delegate it, but he followed up to make sure all of it was done right. And that was a good thing. And so from this, I learned the principle that the worship of God and the house of God needs to continually be a priority with us. Would you agree with that? Amen? We have to put God first in our life. And God expects that of us. God doesn't, like I said Sunday morning, God doesn't want our leftovers. God wants us to make worshiping him a priority. But I tell you, beloved, it's very easy to, to get distracted. Very easy to be pulled aside. I love the story of when um, during the, the uh, World Series years ago, the uh, New York Yankees were playing the Milwaukee Braves, 
Yogi Bear was the catcher, and Hank Aaron was up to bat, to bat. And Yogi Bear was trying to distract Hank Aaron. And he said, hey, Hank, you're not holding the bat right. You should have the trademark facing you so you could read it. And Hank Aaron just ignored him. And when the pitcher threw the ball, Hank Aaron knocked the ball over the left field bleacher for a home run. And as he rounded the base and came home, he looked at Yogi Berra. He said, I didn't come up here to read. I love that story. He, he wasn't going to get distracted. It's very easy to get distracted. But God wants us to focus on him and not be distracted away from the thing for which he created us, and that's to worship him, to enjoy him, to put him first in our life. There's a great illustration of this in the book of Haggai. Right after the exiles returned to their land, they b- began rebuilding the temple which had been destroyed. They laid the foundation, but then they suddenly stopped. They got distracted, and they got so caught up in their own life and building their own houses. And 16 years went by, and nothing happened with the temple. And God sent Haggai the prophet to the people to stir them up. And you remember the message he said, consider your ways. Examine your hearts. Where is God in all of this? You have forgotten the Lord. You've allowed yourself to get distracted away from the main thing. And so he tells them in in Haggai chapter 1, you know, stop making excuses You set proper priorities, and you go, and you serve for my glory. Go, get wood, build my house, make worshiping me a priority again. Stop being selfish. Consider your ways, he said. And so we need to learn from that. And by the way, they did that, and God blessed them for it. So we need to, here's the fourth thing. Don't let difficult circumstances scare you away from dedication to God. Because everything Joab, or excuse me, Joash did to restore the worship of God was good, but again, he stumbles at the finish line. Because you know what happened? Look down at verse number 17. Then Haziel, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and, he, and took it. And Haziel set his face to go up to Jerusalem. Remember this king of Syria? This is the one that Elisha anointed, and then Elisha wept because he knew this was a cruel man who was going to, um, who was, who was going to uh, basically be a, uh, a thorn in the side of God's people and do so many cruel things. And here's this man now. He's king of Syria, and he's systematically conquering, and he conquers uh, one area of Gath, and now he's going to go to Jerusalem. And, and so Joash, the king, is afraid. And you know what he does? When he was threatened by this dangerous attack, listen to, listen to what happened in verse 18. And Joash, king of Judah, took all the hallowed things that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, his father's kings of Judah, had dedicated, and his own hallowed things, and all the gold that was found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord in the king's house, and sent it to Haziel, king of Syria, and he went away from Jerusalem. What happened? Haziel threatened him. He, was a, he posed a, himself as a real danger. And what does Joash do? Does he trust in God? No, he doesn't. He took all the treasures and monies and resources that he had collected, he had brought together, and he uses them to bribe this ungodly king of Syria. So the king goes away. You talk about stumbling at the finish line. One commentator said this, Joash was able to refurbish the temple, but in the end he had to rob it. Joash plunders the very temple he spent repairing and trying to get refurbished. And uh, in the end, um, he, he stumbles terribly. And so this is, this is just a terrible way to end. And how does he die? It, it, it's even worse. Look down in verse number uh, 19. And the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And his servants arose and made a conspiracy and slew Joash in the house of Milo. There were two assassins, and they got tired of him, and he is assassinated, and he dies in an ignominious way. And um, 
And so it's just a terrible ending. All the good things Joash did earlier, all the godly goals, all the great intentions were, were undone when he allowed himself to be intimidated by a dangerous circumstance from a wicked king, and it intimidated him to the point to where he just gave up and he did what was dishonoring to the Lord. Every good thing that he had done up to that point was just simply undone. All the money that was saved to repair the house of God was given out of fear. What was meant to be given to glorify God was given over to the devil because of fear. Terrible way to end. And the devil won. You know, there are many people that allow the devil and his crowd to scare them away from devotion to God. Friend, don't let that happen to you. It may be that you're in a circumstance that's intimidating to you. You're in a circumstance that might be dangerous. You're afraid of your well-being. You might have a Haziel staring you in the face. Don't let difficult circumstances scare you away from dedication to Almighty God. Because if you do, you're not going to end the race well. It's just like here in the life of Joash. And so I just encourage you, beloved, end well. And well, listen to this verse. Jesus is our example. Looking unto Jesus, the author and what? Finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. No one ran a better race than Jesus. He was the author and finisher of our faith. And so let's make that our goal. I just want to finish strong. You know, there are many things that I admire about Pastor Johnson, many things that I admire about him. But you know, one of the things I think I admire about him the most is the way he finished strong for God. And I, I you know, I, I uh, the other day, I had this kind of crazy thing happen to me. I was, uh, I like to listen to sermons on YouTube. And, uh, so every once in a while, I'll just click onto the app, and then what will happen is a bunch of sermons will come up. And I clicked on the app, this was about a week ago, and there a sermon came up that Pastor Johnson had preached. And there was Pastor Johnson right on the screen in front of me. And I thought, wow, you know, I, I want to listen to this. And the title of the sermon was, A, a Life Well Lived. And I kind of looked at it, and I thought, you know, this was the second to the last sermon that he pre- ever preached before the Lord took him home. And in the sermon, he was talking about Abraham and the life of Abraham, how he lived a good life, and he ended well. But I think everything he said about Abraham could apply to him and the way he lived his life. And I just remember watching that, and I was so blessed by it. And my prayer was, God, help me to end well like he did. Help me to persevere and run the race and end strong just like he did. Jesus was his example as well the author and finisher of our faith. Let's bow for prayer tonight. And if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, just want to just take a moment and just speak to you. Friend, if you're here and you've never put your full faith in Jesus, I would just encourage you to do that right now. Jesus loves you. He came and ran this race for you. He didn't run it for himself. He entered the race of life here. He persevered through many dangers. He continued to do what was right in the eyes of his father all the way up until the end. He lived a righteous life. In fact, he he did that for all of us. All of his righteousness when you put your faith in him, is attributed to you. And when he died on the cross, he paid your sin debt. And if you want to have eternal life, you just simply put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you. And he will. And then ask the Lord this, Lord, help me to run a good race. Help me to finish strong. I don't want to stumble at the finish line. I want to finish strong. Father, I pray that that will be the prayer of all of us here tonight. We live in a challenging and dangerous world. 
a world that is full of distractions, a world that's threatening to pull us out of the way all the time. But Lord, you being our help, you being our example, the author and finisher of our faith, help us, Lord, to run the race and to finish well. And we pray all this in Jesus' name.